Peter Marco and Company at Century 21 Modern Realty Results. And by the Skinner Accident Injury Attorneys at SkinnerWins.com. And studio with the Admiral Bill Stumblefield. Billy, good, good morning, stuff. Rob. Sending you here with Mike Hornby. It's a good day to be a Republican. Maria Lawrence, an all-star. It is a great day to be here. Um, I feel like I've really earned my pay today. <laughs> you have, uh, <laughs> as well as Colin. Yeah. Yeah. And your pay, is, your pay yeah, is but zero, you, but Colin actually gets money at the end of the two weeks. <laughs> but you also pointed out what Maria did to earn her money, which is not much. Just sitting in this oh, air-conditioned office. Sitting in an air-controlled room. Whereas Colin's running all over the place. I'm pointed questions, Bill. Come on. <laughs> Throw put, me a and, bone here. And, and putting up with Bill. <laughs> and putting up with Bill. <laughs> Great day to be an American yeah, today. Right. Owner Michael Hornby, also known as Delegate Hornby. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Maria. And we welcome Hello. a Paisan into the room as well. Gino Chiarelli, good morning. G- I'll say it the way you're supposed to say it, Gino. That's right. Gino I got, Chiarelli. The, uh, I got the Americanized version when my family immigrated over here in the 20s. So Which is cool. I'm, I, I rock with the, the SH sound, but it is nice to finally be out here and make it to Berkeley County. Yeah, well, it's good to have you, man. We've had some good conversations via telephone. We have. I know that you are a resident of the Delta House in uh, in Charleston. And there. he stayed at Casa de Hornby last night. Goodness, you might as well be adopted. Crescia made a whole room for him. Did she make baked ziti yesterday? She made I heard about the baked ziti, but we were busy. We didn't we didn't get to it, so it's just my excuse to come back. You know, you're never too busy for baked ziti. Amen. <laughs> right? Amen. You got to have the baked ziti. Yeah. So uh, you heard uh, two new delegates uh, via telephone: Lisa White, uh, Dr. Joe DeSoto. And I'm sure it's not uh, too much of a stretch back for you to remember when you were new and Mike, when you were new, what do newly elected delegates who've never served before not know that you know now? Uh, It's funny that you bring this up because me and Mike were just talking about this a little bit earlier and they don't know what they don't know yet. There is a a whole process that you have to learn and become uh, acclimized to and it's... uh, there's a lot. There's a big learning curve, and I think that coming in humble is the key to success. Understanding that you're new to the process, understanding that you have to learn how the entire thing works first is going to take you a long way because learning the ropes is the most important part because uh, once you come back, if you come back, uh, that's when you learn how to make the process work for you as opposed to how it works in general. So it's funny hearing them talk, and uh, they all have these big plans, and uh, the process will be very humbling. For, for sure, but it sounds like we have a lot of good, smart people on the way, and so we're optimistic. Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, I went down there thinking I'd change the world in the first six weeks, and um, it, yeah, I learned really fast that that's just not the way. Did you realize you're lucky to get a bill passed? <laughs> I, was, out of committee I was lucky to get one bill passed in my first first session. It's the, it's and it's the, the bill that I didn't even think would get anywhere. <laughs> same <laughs> adage of yeah. what Height and I talk about, like how the sausage is made. Um, I... You know, I think most people think that what you see is what you get. And what you see is not anything of how, of what you get. What you see Um, in the public eye is mm -hmm. is about 10% of what actually goes on down there. Um, Right. So, um, yeah, it's a huge learning curve, but I think we have some really good delegates um, coming in. Uh, A lot of the uh, incumbents won. Uh, in the house, so we'll All be dealing. With, one. Yeah, so we're dealing with people that we've already built relationships with, which is nice. Um, there are a lot of new people for, for coming in, about twenty odd new people. So, um, but that's every year. Um, it'll be nice to get to meet new people and find out what their agendas are. Mike, well, you have a super, super, super majority, and that in its own right presents a problem to you yes. and Gino. Uh, there is a is. The Republican Party appears to be doing transition. You have the traditional Republicans, some folks say the uh, the economic driven Republicans. Then there is a uh, the cultural warriors, if you will, uh, and some of the individuals that have been elected, I think, kind of approach the cultural warriors. What is your view of reconciling these differences, or oh, we even try? Um. You know, they're, they are going to be who they are, uh, and you, you can't change a person. But um, we know as a caucus that we have the vision for what we think is best for West Virginia. So we have to just move forward at, on, on the course we're going. Um, if, if you notice, a, a lot of those candidates were much closer races uh, from the Democrats came very, very close, whereas... Um, when you look across the state at like a Jimmy Willis or a Gino or Chris Phillips or these people that 
um, are part of the, the major caucus. They won handily 40, 50 percent. Um, it seems to me that if, if you are that cultural warrior, if you will, or on the far right, they had much closer races. So hopefully people will understand that you really have to be a part of the team to to, um, to win and, and to do what's right for West Virginia. And let's give credit where it's credit to you. You won by 100%. So I did. I still got less votes than Height, though, <laughs> so I lost a, a lunch bet. And I haven't beaten him in total votes ever. Um, so Back Creek comes out to vote for him, but it is what it is. And you know, so I, your party I, then was at the governor's party, right? Yes. Did you just high five each other there? And I mean, there were there were lots of folks uh, there. I think every lobbyist um, I've ever met in Charleston was there last night too. So uh, all the Charleston news yeah. media was there, Morgantown media. Um, it 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 generated. I mean, Patrick had a great sh turnout. And there was a lot of energy, um, but there were a lot of people vying for his attention last night. Gino, to get airtime, you got to use sharp elbows and just push him to the side. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's okay. We, we we talk a whole lot at, at Delta House. Believe me, there's uh, plenty of conversations that I, I make my way into no matter what. Yes. But I think you made a good point about the, the Republicans and the different flavors that yeah. we have. Um, Republicans have sort of branded themselves over the last decade as the big tent party, and we've welcomed all sorts of people, which... Uh, has a lot of positives, and I think there's a lot of, I don't want to necessarily say negatives, but it makes things complicated because now we have a ton of different flavors. And we almost have this parliamentary style system in, in the House with the supermajority where you have your culture people, you have your chamber of commerce types, you have your libertarians. So um, oftentimes we're very much united on, on a lot of these issues, other times not so much. But I think one of the big things that I've learned especially is you can bring your agenda to Charleston. Uh, you can even get things done, but the most important part, like Hornby just talked about, um, you have to understand that you're a part of the body. It's not the you show. It's the us show. It's the West Virginia show. That's the most important thing. A lot of people forget that the citizens are who we work for. Is there a unifying theme in the current Republican Party, I is economics driving the, uh, the Republicans, or what is the underlying theme? Well, I think that if we tap into what Patrick Morrissey really talked about during the campaign, if we talk about what effectively got him elected by, by over 30 points, is he wants to talk about deregulation. He wants to talk about building our economy and making the state attractive to outside, outside people while still retaining our core West Virginia identity. So I think that building towards the future is something that we're all agreeing on. And while that's a broad theme... I think that it's something that brings us all brings us all together because nobody wants to see us fail. Yeah, everybody wants to build toward the future. The question is, how do you build toward the future? That's well. I go ahead. Well, I, I would say we have to build out our, our tax base, right? So we have to bring citizens to West Virginia. We have to be a an increasing population. That's our first goal because with a decreasing population and with an older population, our tax base goes down. So I think we're on the right path to increasing the population. It is economic development, Bill. I, I think it is in improving our education system, whatever 49? means we have. Yeah, we need to be better in all these these issues. So um, can we do it in one session? No. Can we do it over a course of time? I believe we can. I think we've got our, our fiscal books in, in place now. Now we can start really attacking those those real issues. Yeah, I was going to pick up on that. Uh, uh, Craig Blair takes, I think, justifiably a lot of credit of trying to remold the uh, some of our laws and regulations yeah. so to be more attractive to businesses. And I think we as a state are in a position to build upon those. I want to talk a little bit about Amendment 1. We haven't really discussed that yeah. this morning at all. It looks like that's, I don't think 100% of the votes are in yet, but it looks like it's going it, to pass. It, I, I believe it's going to pass, and, and I've got to give credit to Pat McGeehan and the work he did across the state and what it was really personal for him because he had a friend go through this and he told his story on the House floor. Um, I, I'm so happy for him. I'm so happy it, it passed. I, I know there's a lot of confusion with that amendment. It wasn't put on the ballot in written right that we feel in the house that the senate kind of confused things with it it was very plain and simple when pat wrote it um but i'm so happy for for pat and the, and the work he's done and i think it just codifies something that 
West Virginia is about. We, we're about life. And it was an inter- but, It's an interesting discussion because uh, I've spoken with many people who are very pro-life yeah. who did not vote for Amendment 1 because they said that their libertarian side of them came out and it's not really the government's business to tell people that they, <coughs> they can't uh, take advantage of this service for lack of a better way of putting it. It divides even pro-life people. But I, I, I don't think that's what the amendment did. It didn't change. It was it was illegal already. It just made sure that in the future, if, if these businesses wanted to come here, it had to go through a two-thirds majority correct to, to go back on to, to a vote to the people but and, but and that's what i really liked about it but mike the and i've heard this in some ads recently and the republicans say we're all about protecting liberties in my view this is another chipping away at one of our personal decisions see i i don't think i i don't believe that i think in the constitution it, it says we have to protect life and in and, and that's why i'm pro-life and and I think a business shouldn't be able to tell a 14-year-old girl because she's confused or depressed that you look but, at Canada, they're, they're letting teenagers commit suicide. These aren't cancer victims. These aren't, it's gotten to the point where the insurance company will say, well, you know, your eight-year-old has uh, whatever cancer it is. It, it's going to cost us too much to treat her. We think she should just commit suicide and that's just abhorrent to me and it, it, I, I know we disagree on this Bill, yeah we do but, because and I don't know enough about Canada to do yeah. point counterpoint but the state that's generally thrown out as an example Oregon. is Oregon yes and yet if you look at Oregon there are several several steps you have to go through step guard so what the the position that you're uh, laying out doesn't really exist it, in Oregon the, the, the gentleman that um, Pat was talking about one of his constituents was depressed. He didn't have a life uh, cancer. Or anything. He was depressed. He didn't have any friends. He'd lost his job. And he just decided to kill himself in Oregon. We can prevent that within our community. We can prevent that by taking care of our family. I, I just, I, I'm on the other side with you. I know. I, ju- I just see that our liberties yeah. is something that we should be able to make a decision ourselves without the state jump in and tell us what we Gino's can do. Gino's perspective yeah. on this, you're yeah. a young yeah. fellow. What, how did you feel about Amendment 1? Well, I was uh, I was one of the sponsors of it, actually. I mm-hmm. try to maintain a consistently pro-life stance from, from womb to tomb. I'm uh, against the death penalty, so I try to maintain that, that life position very consistently. Uh, as far as the, the amendment itself goes, I was totally in support of it. And I think that one of the big things that Mike already brought up is the fact that we are trying to prevent the slippery slope. Because if you do look at other states, or not other states, if you look at other countries, places like Canada, they're euthanizing healthy young adults because they are depressed. That's not a road that we want to go down. We don't want people to um, devalue life to the point where they feel that suicide is is a valid option. And also, I think one important thing to note is that the, the amendment does not prevent withdrawing life-saving care if you want to remove yourself from from that situation uh, if you want to prevent yourself from from taking any medication that might keep you alive any sort of uh, um, medical procedures that are that are keeping you alive that is still your your option it's just it says that a a, a doctor cannot give you a prescription that will that kill will you. kill you this the, the vote uh, is pretty close to 50 50 uh, the margin on this one is not uh, great whatsoever. So the state appeared to be fairly, at least of those who bothered to vote, the state appeared to be divided down the middle on this one here. And uh, I found that fascinating, uh, too, because on pretty much everything else in this state politically, it's about 70% one way we were, and 30% we were, the other. We were discussing um, last night and this morning, it's surprising that there were no surprises I think that personally, I think that the biggest surprise is that the amendment passed. I was surprised I was by it too. Very surprised I was that it actually passed. I, I think surprised. there was, and I think you both alluded to this, a lot of confusion because yeah, of wording. Yeah. If you think back to the four amendments <sighs> that took up four pages um, in the last election, this was one little piece at the end of the 
of the ballot, basically. And we actually, um, so Gino, I work at hospice, so the panhandle, and you know, we had lots of questions from people just whether because, this would affect you, right? yes, yeah. yes, whether there were yeah. going to be some um, effects. And we, you know, just like the West Virginia Hospice Council, we did not take um, a, an opinion or did not put out an opinion. We tried to, you know, share the information that had been um, had been put out there with um, with our staff and volunteers. But um, I think there was definitely confusion. And then the people who said, wait, isn't this already part of the Constitution? So now I'm voting to add something that already is illegal. Yeah. That was the, the and there's, what we there's, had heard. There's people that supported the amendment but ended up voting against it. There's people that were against it, but ended up voting for it. So there was a lot of that kind of back and forth. Mm -hmm. But I do ultimately think overall that with it looking like it's about to pass, I do think that it does reflect accurately what the people of West Virginia wanted. Well, well they I'm, voted I'm, on it. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm less surprised. I'm not surprised that it's a surprise because there was a very active and I think effective campaign lobbying for passage. There was no campaign arguing against the passage. Well, there was a heavy digital campaign against. I did not see the digital. There, there, was, a, there was a I serious the, campaign saw, digitally. Yeah, okay. um, but Pat made sure, and, and I know he reached out to me and said, hey, what I need to get on your station. We need to do this. Um, so um, he ran a, a, a nice campaign on air with us uh, and i think it helped but there are a lot of mailers as well there i got three or four mailers you did okay. that uh uh that i did not get any that i don't think they them. spent any against that's right with the no, mailers because yeah, exactly it was already illegal here so putting money behind that issue kind of maybe they and i think i think some of the church communities got involved as well yes, i mean i, I certainly heard it um uh within that venue. Was this so. the only amendment on the ballot? Yes. 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 Yeah, Thank so that you. also Thank helps you. too. I think most people agreed the reason why the four amendments failed because it was amendment overload when you ran all four together. Well, I think, yeah, there was four, but also the governor came out against all four. Yeah. So well, that didn't we, help either. Berkeley, we went against the governor, but the rest of the state, they do exactly what the governor wanted. How about a legal challenge? Joe Ferretti is saying he thinks there'll be a legal challenge. There, there could this. be. I mean, but I, I don't, I, I don't see it. It, it, it. The way the actual amendment reads, I, I don't think it really but, is going to... It doesn't further really illegalize it. It just makes yeah, it part of the Constitution. But, the Constitution. Yeah, but they also... It, the, it, the, the legal challenge is going to be whether the actual full amendment was on the ballot. Exactly. That's, exactly. It. That's, that, it. That's, that's it. That's the legal exactly. challenge, and we talked about that the other day. We did. Um, right. So then that, they have a point with that, too. Could, that could be... Again. Well, I think that Hoppy Kirchner was talking on his show about how he thinks that, it, based off of his understanding of the law, is that the legislature decides what language makes it onto the actual ballot, yeah. right? Uh, I, again, I, 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 that's not my department. I, I wouldn't be on judiciary. Uh, if they put me on that committee, I'd quit. <laughs> that's a strong statement. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you right now, Roger, do not put me on judiciary. Yeah, regardless of <laughs> how I got on there, there are three parts to the Constitution Amendment. Right. Only one part was reflected on the ballot. Yep. And as you head to, into, uh, what, I guess, a quick January swearing in and then a February session, uh, a lot of leadership changes will be taking place in the House. Have you guys uh, already been part of the circus behind the scene as to who wants to be what? Sausage making. Uh, you know, again, like somebody said earlier, it, we, we serve at the will of the, of, of the Speaker, so he decides who, where, how you serve. We do get to ask for committees, mm -hmm. so every... Everybody would get a survey, hey, what committees do you want? And you list them in order of 12, I think, Gina, right? Uh, um, whether you get those requests is really up to the speaker. I'm not talking about your committees. I'm talking about who's the head of these committees. How much of that's been going well, on? Because there, health, there's a lot of vacating going on. Health committee is going to have a new chair. Judiciary is going to have a new chair. Um, I believe most of the subcommittees are going to have a new chair. I think the only committee that probably stays exactly the same as finance. education finance and, fi and well, we, well we have a new, new vice chair new yeah, vice, vice chair, chair of finance so uh we have an idea who we think that's going to be but we don't none of us know until roger decides what's the turnover of the 100 seats this term any idea at this time 28 i think so 28 Between 25 and 30 yeah, yeah. And, and it was about a third in the last election right so 
It's yeah. it's uh, it, it's roughly. And here's the thing: is during our term, we had like 15 people quit too. So right. we did have a high number that, of resignations. Resigned and got appointed, and those appointed people got reelected. So, and then there's a bunch of people that didn't run again, that are new coming in. So, uh, it, it are it term is, limits necessary in the house considering the turnover anyway? No, I, I, two year pops. I don't think. So. I don't listen. If if you put a let's say a four year term limit on on a house member, you ain't gonna have anybody that gets anything done. I mean, it takes it takes a term to learn how how the yeah. process works for sure. I mean, I could see eight, twelve years if you really want to, but the, the, like somebody like Paul Espinosa, mm-hmm. been down there a long time. The leadership role and the the advice he gave me as a new delegate coming in, I could go into his office because I was next to him. He could teach me really fast how it was for for Gino and Jimmy. They all have their people that have been down there. Like uh, Jimmy Willis has uh, Zatezalo. Um, there are people down there that you can get knowledge from because you can't go down there with an agenda. It just it doesn't happen. You, you, you can walk in and say you want to do this, but that's not the way it works. Gina, what are you doing the rest of the day up here? Maybe I'll do a little bit more Berkeley County exploring, but it's uh, the trek back to Montegalia for me. All right, man. Have a safe drive. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mr. Hornby, I'll be seeing you around. Yes, sir. For at least for a little while. We, we did a four-hour ter- tour yesterday at Berkeley County with uh, Mr. Gino. Oh, very nice. Maybe. Took him through Dysfunction Junction. A lot of great stuff going on here. <laughs> Our segment today brought to you in part by CMA 